Hello again everyone and this is my third video of the day. I can't quite believe that I'm doing three videos, three tarot tag responses in a single day but um, I've enjoyed doing them so much and I have some things that I want to talk about and so I'm going to do it and I'm going to cheat a little bit in this one because I'm actually going to do, uh, well first of all I'm going to respond to two tarot tags in one video, I'm going to attempt to anyway and also I'm responding to a couple of tarot tags that I don't think are necessarily particularly active at the moment because they are from uh, quite a while ago, in fact probably over a year ago. Um, and uh, But the reason is that I just think they're really really good tarot tags and I wasn't on YouTube a year ago so I didn't have the chance to participate in them so I thought why not now, better late than never. And um, I hope this all works out because I've got a new uh, camera setup, lighting setup, and um, I'm quite pleased. I've got one of these things that clips onto uh, a table or a desk and it holds the camera instead of propping my tripod up on a pile of books, which is what I have been doing up until now. Um, and I was prompted to do this by Gail George Sedan from the For Love of Cards Facebook group. And uh, I, I think that, that he might be poised to perhaps join us in YouTube and so if you are Gail then I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you uh, and thank you very much for the tip about these pieces of equipment. Hopefully it works. Uh, don't tell my other half but I have actually got this uh, thing clipped onto the windowsill in this room because I tried clipping it to the desk but then every time I touched the desk the whole thing wobbled and now it's clipped onto the windowsill hopefully not damaging the paintwork and hopefully it won't ping off and catapult me in the face in the middle of this video. If it does, I might keep that in as an outtake, but I'm hoping it doesn't. So hopefully this works. I've also got a new light. I hope you're not getting too much glare from my, my head. Somebody should invent some kind of anti-glare dust for bald YouTube bloggers. <gasps> I've patented that idea. Nobody else invented it. I am doing it. Patented me, definitely. Okay. I think it's probably a bit too late for me to be doing this because uh, I seem to be kind of ranting and raving already. So let's get to the get to the point. Let's cut to the chase. And chase actually brings me to one of the people who I am VRing to, because my um, my video is a VR to chase in two of owls. I have to tell you, Chase, that for a while I thought your channel was called Chase Two Owls. And I actually found myself thinking, why would you chase two owls? It'd be hard enough to catch one. But that's just because people talked about you as Chase, two of owls. And I, I heard it as Chase, two owls. But now I understand that your channel is called Two of Owls and you are called Chase. So we're good, we're good, we get it. And the tag that I'm responding to is the one that you set up called hashtag is tarot real. And because I also had been thinking about uh, another tag, which was Tom Benjamin, author of the fabulous Tarot on Earth. If you have not got that book yet, then you definitely should get it. Uh, he set up a hashtag probably around, this, around about the same time, maybe a bit earlier, called I Believe in Tarot. And uh, quite similar, but not exactly the same. So one, one about... Um, uh, you know, is tarot real? You know, do you believe that tarot is a real thing? That it actually is 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 real. <laughs> um, and also, I believe in tarot. You know, what is your belief system around tarot? And of course, you know, those things are quite related. So I thought I would uh, talk about them both at the same time because they're a bit related. And this does relate and does touch a little bit on a video that I did a while ago, which was my video on non-duality. Um, uh, which was done around midwinter time last year um, and it was on non-duality and how I believe tarot works and at the time I wasn't aware of these, these tags so I possibly would have used these tags in that video but uh, and I did think about going back and just just tagging the videos with these tags but then I thought no let's uh, let's update the conversation and let's speak a bit more about where my thought process is in relation to is tarot real and my beliefs around tarot. So um, let's take the question is tarot real first because that seems to me to be quite an important one to look at and the short answer from me is yes tarot is real. 
you know, tarot is definitely real in the sense that it is a thing. You can pick up a deck of tarot cards. I think Chase made this point in his own video. You can pick up a deck of tarot cards. It's a physical thing, a deck of tarot cards. Nobody can deny that. Um, tarot itself, of course, started life as a game and nobody can deny that. That is just, just fact. Uh, the question becomes a bit more interesting when you consider the system of tarot and what tarot I was about to say claims for itself, but it doesn't make any claims for itself, but what tarot experts and luminaries over the years have claimed for tarot, what, what people have believed about tarot, that it can tell the future, um, that it uh, has within it encoded lots of spiritual lessons and information, um, that it is somehow able to divine things and discover things uh, beyond what we can know rationally. So lots of things are claimed for tarot and lots of psycho-spiritual and philosophical and magical um, and esoteric systems have undoubtedly been mapped onto tarot. But the general consensus now is that all of that is, is pretty much coincidental. It's not that tarot emerged from those metaphysical systems. It started as a game and in that game a certain set of archetypes and a certain structure was uh, in terms of the major major arcana, the trumps. Uh, you know, part one one name for the game uh, early on was Triumphi, the, the trumps. Um, th those archetypes existed, and the structure existed. You know, the four suits and the ten cards and the sixteen court cards and so on. And over time, what's happened is various different schools of thought have been mapped against tarot. And here's a fascinating thing, because of course, what we know, those of us who study. Uh, is that those schools of thought map against it very, very well, very well indeed. So if you look at um, astrology, if you look at Kabbalah, if you look at um, the Jungian functions and compare those with the court cards, then you'll see that they map very, very well indeed. And then over time, uh, Masonic symbolism, uh, Eastern symbolism, the I Ching and so on, have all been mapped to varying degrees of success uh, against the tarot structure. So um, so those, those are just kind of facts in the sense that that, that is what happens. Tarot does um, have this structure that allows it to incorporate all of those things. But whether those things actually um, are intrinsic to tarot is just another question really, and is another consideration. And um, so I suppose where that leads us is, you know, is the, is the tarot that we commonly hear about now, this, this tarot that has some kind of uh, metaphysical power, is that real? And I mentioned in my previous video that one of the quotes that I think is really useful in this context comes from uh, Art Rosengarten, who wrote the book Tarot and Psychology and who has a new book coming out, I think, later this year. Um, and he pointed out, I heard him interviewed once, and he pointed out uh, in this interview that he is often asked the question, it, it, when people ask him about tarot readings, is, is, uh, is a tarot reading always accurate? And he, his response to that is that, that in a sense, it's a wrong question. The, the better question is, is a tarot reading always relevant? Because if you go for accuracy, even those of us, certainly from my point of view, who are avowed tarot fans and see value in tarot, and that gives you a hint to the, the answer I'm giving to these tags, even those of us who are real fans of tarot know that it is possible, although you might have a set of cards laid out that, um, that different tarot readers will give a degree of similarity in the reading, and it could be quite a lot of similarity because, you know, the cards mean what they mean in certain contexts. There is also room for a great deal of interpretation and naturally enough different tarot readers will interpret things differently and if you're reading for yourself you'll approach things differently depending on your mood, depending on what else you've uh, got on your mind, depending on what's happening in your life etc etc. So accuracy can be quite difficult to pin down in any kind of uh, divinatory process. That's not to say that it doesn't exist uh, and in fact one of the things that Tom Benjamin um, does so well in his book Tarot on Earth is point out that it's really important if you're going to 
be a tarot reader and if you're going to read tarot for yourself that you discipline yourself to not be overly woolly that you don't simply look at the card and just just decide in the moment what you think it you'd like it to mean but you actually discipline yourself to ask no what was the question i asked you know where are those cards in relation to the the spread that i've set up um and what does that mean what suits are here what numbers are here um how do they combine let's let's distill it down as close as we can and as accurately as we can to a relevant interpretation and to a, a precise interpretation based on what we have in front of us um but art rosengarten's comment i think is is valid in the sense that he's saying um when you ask the question is tarot always relevant then the answer to that can almost certainly be yes if you approach the reading in the correct way and you're willing to engage with it and you're willing to to use it in a constructive way and in my experience one of the things that can go wrong in tarot is people um and i, and, you know, I include myself in this if i have a poor tarot reading it's usually when i've thought of a question maybe haven't defined it very well uh, I've dealt the cards out into a spread, maybe haven't structured it very well, and then simply um, do a superficial, superficial reading and just, just, just don't delve into the reading, don't give myself time either to prepare or to interpret the cards or to consider the cards and sit with it and really kind of contemplate what is coming up. Um, so, uh, you know, in that sense, I think one of the things that we can say in terms of is tarot real, um, it, you know, if you're looking at it as an interpretive process, as an interpretive discipline, which allows you to um, to have reflected back at you perspectives that you wouldn't have picked up had you not done the tarot reading, then yes, it's real. And, you know, I believe in tarot, pick up Tom's hashtag because I know the power of that I know what can happen when you sit in a reading that is properly structured that you have, where you have defined the question really well and where you have done a really thorough interpretation of the cards and you have allowed yourself to go deeply into each card and one of the things that I love to do with tarot cards for example in my own approach is to see the cards not always as messengers of answers but uh, messengers of, of questions. And I talked a bit about this in um, my VR to Fables Den, which was five deep tarot questions. Um, because one of the questions that she asked was, you know, which card do you like seeing coming up, see coming up in a reading? And I mentioned it was the Six of Swords. Um, and I talked a bit about some of the questions that the Six of Swords would, would ask uh, in a reading. So I think of the card sometimes as coming with empowering questions. And that's the coaching approach that I take to, to tarot. Anyway, I'm kind of digressing a bit. So uh, my short answer to is tarot real? Yes, it's real in the sense that it, it is a thing. And is it real in the sense that it is a valuable uh, process and discipline? Yes, it can be, without a doubt. Um, but like most tools, it can be used wrongly. You know, if you take a hammer and a nail and you're building a bit of furniture and you, you hammer the, the nail into a piece of wood to attach it to another piece of wood, that might be what you need to do if that's the appropriate tool. Um, it might not be the appropriate tool, you might need a screw and a screwdriver and a drill. But let's just say that you do need that tool and you hammer the nail in. If you keep hammering it, or if you do it carelessly, or you use the wrong size of nail, or you use a hammer that's too big and heavy and strong and dense the wood, then they might be the right tool, but they won't necessarily give you the right results. And so it is with tarot. So, um, uh, I believe in tarot, but I believe that a degree of discipline is required around it. So with that said, um, I would like to read something to you that I think is relevant in this context, because thinking about um, how tarot works, if we agree that it does work, I've mentioned before that I, I think, in my own mind, I have got two broad, um, I suppose, belief systems that I hang tarot on if i'm if i'm pushed to uh justify not that i feel any need to justify how how tarot works or my belief in tarot but if i if i were there are two broad schools of thought that i happily subscribe to and one of them is the very simple one that um that because tarot is a group of symbols and sets of meaning encoded into images and because we are storytelling creatures 
um, meaning-making creatures, when we do a tarot reading, either for ourselves or if somebody else is doing it for us and we see the cards and they're, or they're describing the cards or even they're just describing the meaning of the cards to us, I think it's entirely possible that all that's happening, all that's happening, is that our brains are interpreting those images and those meanings and those stories and are mapping them against our own circumstances and our own life in a way that allows us to make sense of the world or make sense of our situation or to think of a different uh, perspective on a difficult problem. That's, that's one school of thought and I'm completely comfortable with that. Um, I don't think that that in any way diminishes tarot or limits the usefulness of tarot. Um, however, I, like other people who read tarot and who have read for others, have had the experience of things coming out of a reading, meanings, uh, perspectives, um, symbols, uh, inspirations, that sometimes seem to go a bit beyond the simple rational explanation of here are just some interesting symbols and which seem to go deeper. And on that basis I'm very open also to the idea of synchronicity, which is the, the principle that, that Jung, the word that Jung used to describe a, uh, an a, cause, a meaningful a-causal um, connectivity principle. Um, and he writes about this at the beginning of one of the translations, the Wilhelm translation, I think, of the I Ching. And um, I've got a couple of quotes from that that I think I would like to read to you because I think it illustrates his perspective very well and I think says quite a lot about what that particular school of thought could could be and how it could work. So this is from the foreword to, to the I Ching. Um, this assumption involves a certain curious principle that I have termed synchronicity, a concept that formulates a point of view diametrically opposed to that of causality. Since the latter is merely statistical truth and not absolute, it is a sort of working hypothesis of how events evolve one out of another, whereas synchronicity takes the coincidence of events in space and time as meaning something more than mere chance, namely a peculiar interdependence of objective events among themselves as well as with the subjective psychic states of the observer or observers. And then he goes on later on to say, the ancient Chinese mind contemplates the cosmos in a way comparable to that of the modern physicist who cannot deny that his model of the world is a decidedly psychophysical structure. The microphysical event includes the observer just as much as the reality underlying the I Ching comprises subjective, i.e. psychic, conditions in the totality of the momentary situation. Just as causality describes the sequence of events, so synchronicity to the Chinese mind deals with the coincidence of events. The causal point of view tells us a dramatic story about how D came into existence. It took its origin from C, which existed before D, and C in its turn had a father, B, etc. The synchronistic view, on the other hand, tries to produce an equally meaningful picture of coincidence. How does it happen that A, B, C, D, etc. appear all in the same moment and in the same place? It happens in the first place because the physical events A and B are of the same quality as the psychic events C and D, and further because all are the exponents of one and the same momentary situation. The situation is assumed to represent a legible or understandable picture. So. He's talking here, of course, about the um, the contrast between what you might call a um, dualistic view of life and um, a view of life which is non-dualistic. So the dualistic view of life has this view that in this world of duality um, there is cause and effect and effect follows cause and you can't have one without the other in the right sequence. And the non-dualistic approach, the kind of Taoist approach and uh, the approach in Advaita Vedanta and in some um, Western forms of non-duality like the Course in Miracles and so on, actually uh, posits that things that seem to be causally related in time 
mutually arise from the same source, which is simply the totality of everything. And although it looks to us as though A is the cause of B, in reality they both they are there is no cause and effect. They both emanate from the same underlying source in one indivisible whole. And that's quite difficult to wrap our minds around when we live in a dualistic world and when we have a dualistic ego-based perspective. Um, so he, 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 Jung talks a bit more about this and um, actually before I read that I'll, I'll no no we, we will read this let's, let's do this I was going to read you something from a current non-dual um, thinker but we'll get to that in a second. So um, so yeah, so so here he he goes on in the in the um, introduction of the I Ching to say I agree with Western thinking that any number of answers to my questions were possible. He's talking here about a reading he's done with the I Ching, and he's he's um, uh, tossed the coins and developed the I Ching hexagrams and he's interpreted it and it's been meaningful to the question that he's asked. It's worth reading this introduction to the I Ching if you're interested in tarot or divination or any of this stuff. Then it, it's well worth reading it. So he says, I agree with Western thinking that any number of answers to my question were possible, and I certainly cannot assert that another answer would not have been equally significant. However, the answer received was the first and only one. We know nothing of other possible answers. It pleased and satisfied me. To ask the same question a second time would have been tactless, and so I did not do it. Uh, the master speaks but once, and he put that in quotes. The heavy-handed pedagogic approach that attempts to fit irrational phenomena into a preconceived rational pattern is anathema to me. Indeed, such things as this answer should remain as they were when they first emerged to view, for only then do we know what nature does when left to herself, undisturbed by the meddlesomeness of man. One ought not to go to cadavers to study life. Moreover, a repetition of the experiment is impossible for the simple reason that the original situation cannot be reconstructed. Therefore, in each instance, there is only a first and single answer. And to me, there's a couple of really important things there. One is that he is talking about uh, the I Ching, interpretation of the I Ching reading, almost in a kind of um, the way that, that one might talk about interpreting art or poetry. And... Um, you know, it, it's just, it, it is what it is within itself. It doesn't have to have um, a cause or a purpose or a rational explanation. It's just beautiful in itself. Um, and I really get that. I really understand that in relation to this. I often say that, you know, if somebody was to say to me, is tarot or any divination system more of an art or a science, I would say it's definitely more of an art. Now, I know that there are some people who might debate that, and maybe we'll do a hashtag on that. But, um, but to me, it's more of an art. So um, that's the first thing. And the second thing I get from this is this very interesting notion that you can never test a divinatory tool. Because I've heard people say if tarot really worked, then you would ask a question and you would deal out the card and you'd get a certain set of cards. And then if you gathered the cards up and you shuffle them again and ask the same question and deal them out, you would get the same cards. Well, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, even if tarot worked, because you're not asking the same question. If you do that, what you're doing in the first case is you're asking a question of the tarot and you're dealing the cards out and you're gathering them up. And if you're trying to get the tarot to tell you the same thing again by showing you the same cards, you're not asking the same question. You're asking a new question and that question is, will you show me the same cards or can you give me the same answer? And it's quite possible that the tarot is just gonna go <laughs> to you. So um, there are a couple of interesting things in there for me. Um, now, I mentioned this non-dual teacher who is our, I don't think he'd call himself a teacher, um, but this, this non-dual expert that is, that is a current, modern non-dual expert. Hmm. And there are a number of them. I mean, you can read uh, non-dual uh, text, you can look at the history of Adv Advaita Vedanta, you could look at the Course in Miracles, you could uh, read the work of Ramana Maharshi, um, uh, an Indian sage. You could read the work of uh, I Am That. I Am That is the name of the book by Nizargadatta Maharaj, and um, uh, and he and, and you know these books are written from a non-dual perspective and are worth reading. But there are some modern people, people like Eckhart Tolle, um, Byron Katie, and this chap who's British called Tony Parsons, and 
he tells a story, and I won't go into all the detail here, but he tells a story of his non-dual experience being that one day Tony Parsons was walking down the road and then all of a sudden there was no Tony Parsons walking down the road, there was just walking down the road. In other words, his sense of being a person, separate from everything else, dropped away completely and he was he couldn't even say that he was one with everything because he had disappeared um, in the sense that he no, no longer or the entity that had previously seen itself as Tony Parsons no longer saw itself as Tony Parsons it saw itself as the whole very difficult to explain in words but he here's what he says a quote from him there is no me and no you no seeker no enlightenment no disciple and no guru there is no better or worse, no path or purpose, and nothing that has to be achieved. All appearance is source. All that apparently manifests in, this hypn in the hypnotic dream of separation, the world, the life story, the search for home, is one appearing as two, the nothing appearing as everything, the absolute appearing as the particular. Um, and then we also have a couple of quotes from, um, well, a quote from Alan Watts, the Zen, Zen philosopher and, and the teacher, um, who did a lot to explain Zen and Taoism to the West. And he speaks about this notion of um, a different mindset in relation to the way that reality is. Taoists view the universe as the same as or inseparable from themselves, so that Lao Tzu could say, the supposed author of the Tao Te Ching, Without leaving my house, I know the whole universe. This implies that the art of life is more like navigation than warfare. For what is important is to understand the winds, the tides, the currents, the seasons, and the principles of growth and decay, so that one's actions may use them and not fight them. And if we subscribe to this view, that there is this flow and this unity and then and this totality, and that everything that exists within a single moment is meaningfully connected and in fact is the same thing appearing as different things then it kind of makes sense why a tarot reading would work and I would suggest that it might even mean you know I've got in front of me here my desk and it's a bit of a mess at the moment frankly there are things scattered all over it there's papers my weight lift lifting gloves are on the desk for some reason because I haven't tidied them away I've got a book I've got um, headphones because I was listening to things earlier I've got a box of pens I've got my computer monitor I've got a telephone I've got another pen I've got a bit of paper uh, I've got a CD I've got lots of things now I look at this and it doesn't really mean anything to me because those things don't have particular meanings encoded into them other than what they are but you might argue that in this particular moment in time, these things are arranged in a particular way, and if they were symbolically um, activated, if you like, if they were representatives of symbolic meaning the way that a tarot reading is, it might tell me something about this intrinsic moment. I don't know, maybe it would. That would explain if we if we subscribe to the idea of tarot and astrology and these divination systems as being meaningf meaningful, it, isn't it possible that everything is meaningful in terms of how it's arranged it's just that we don't we can't read those meanings because they don't speak to us in the way that tarot and astrology and the I Ching can speak to us so that's just speculation on my part um, and I suppose it's worth closing with um, two quotes from the Tao Te Ching uh, supposedly written by Lao Tzu uh, nobody knows if Lao Tzu is a real person or not but um, he's the proposed author and again, if you want to have a sense of um, the perspective that would allow one to entertain the notion that tarot is something that speaks to us of the interconnectedness of everything, then the Tao Te Ching is a good thing to read. And here are a couple of passages. I don't know the numbers of these, unfortunately. I haven't, I haven't looked them up, but you will find them in many translations of the Tao Te Ching. And there are different ones. Um, I'll try and remember to link to some good ones below. So um, here's here's the first passage. When ev and this is talking about the way that we create duality, the way that duality is created the moment we perceive things as being one particular way. When everyone knows when everyone knows beauty as beautiful, there is already ugliness. 
When everyone knows good as goodness, there is already evil. To be and not to be arise mutually. Difficult and easy are mutually realised. Long and short are mutually contrasted. High and low are mutually posited. Before and after are in mutual sequence. In other words, you can't have an up without a down. You can't have a left without a right. You can't have a good without a bad. So the moment you create a thing, the moment we step out into the world of duality, we create one thing and we automatically create its op opposite. Um, and I say we create, um, consciousness creates when we perceive things um, in that way. So uh, in this last passage is one where he is speaking of um, the notion that sometimes it's what we don't see. Uh, it's sometimes the space between things that's most useful. Thirty spokes unite at the wheel's hub. It is the centre hole that makes it useful. Shape clay into a vessel. It is the space within that that makes it useful. Cut out doors and windows for a room. It is the holes which make it useful. Therefore, profit comes from what is there. Usefulness comes from what is not there. And I think that's quite a good thought to close on because um, is tarot real? Yes, I think so. But it doesn't matter if it's not. Do I believe in tarot? Yes, I do. But I don't feel the need to prove that tarot is a thing in order to believe in it. Because I understand that it's the space that tarot creates for us that provides its usefulness. Uh, it's the perspective beyond the world of duality Although within tarot, of course, we see duality, it's the fact that, in my thinking, every tarot card, whichever one that appears, if you're doing a daily draw, whichever one that appears for you, or if you're doing a, a reading with several cards, all those cards that appear, they have their own intrinsic meaning, and they're all connected back into the totality of tarot, and they all lead back, they all lead back, you, you could say they all lead back to the full, and the fool steps out from non-duality and there's always something uh, behind the fool. There's always something that the fool is emanating from and therefore all of those cards emanate from that same source, which is everything. So that is my thoughts on tarot tags. Um, that were put together by Chase from Two of Owls and Tom Benjamin. Chase's one is called Is Tarot Real? And Tom's is I Believe in Tarot. And I'll link both of their original videos down below. And although these tags are older, if you haven't yet done them, or maybe if you have done them and want to do an update, um, I've really enjoyed watching the ones that I've seen already and I'd love to see more. And um, thank you, Chase, and thank you, Tom, for putting together such thoughtful thought-provoking and interesting tags and uh, this has been fun. So I'll see you all again very soon. Take care.